Welcome back everybody. Thank you for visiting the YouTube channel for bestbiblecommentaries.com. In this video, I'm going to compare two of the most popular study Bibles of all time, the Schofield Study Bible and the Ryrie Study Bible. I'm also going to tell you the story of how when one of these men passed away, their book collection sold for over seven million dollars. Before I do that, I invite you to subscribe to my channel uh, if, you like, if you're interested in seeing videos on Biblical Studies resources like commentaries, study Bibles, other reference tools. Also clicking the thumbs up on my video really helps me out. I appreciate that. And feel free to leave a comment or ask a question down below. I'm also going to put links down below to Amazon. So if you would like to get one of these resources, I invite you to use those links. So the Schofield Study Bible and the Ryrie Study Bible are two of the most popular Christian reference resources of the last hundred years. There's a lot of similarities between them. There's more similarities than differences, but there are some key differences and I'm going to point those out. One of the things that both of these resources are known for is that uh, both men, besides being devout believers, were also very devout in their view of dispensational pre-tribulationist premillennialism. If you don't know what that is, I'll, I'll give a basic overview of it a little bit in uh, just a few minutes, a little bit later in the video. So what makes this, the Schofield and Ryrie Study Bible so special? Why do people like them? And uh, a little bit about the viewpoint. That's kind of where I'm taking you in this particular video. So there's bottom of the bottom of the page study notes in each of these study Bibles. I'll also explain why this says number three on it. Why is there a Schofield one, two, and three? I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, and you can see again, bottom of the page notes. In comparison with study Bibles today, there's not a lot of notes in these two books. You know, there's some study Bibles today that include several hundred pages of, of notes and articles. So, um, but these are study Bibles that come from a different time in a different era. So they're just, uh, um, there's just some differences between these and, and ones that have been published recently. The publication of the Schofield study Bible in particular was a, was a momentous event, um, because there weren't a lot of study Bibles at the time. It was published in 1909 and it was continuing in an important Protestant tradition of study Bibles because the Geneva Study Bible was published in the 16th century, which included bottom of the page notes and explanations on the biblical text. So there was some precedent for it, but there again, there wasn't a lot of study Bibles at the time that it was printed and it became extremely uh, influential. So it became really popular because of the explanations. It was easy to understand and it was used in churches. But another place it was used was Bible schools and Bible colleges. Why that was important is because a lot of those schools were training pastors and minister or pastors and uh, missionaries. And so they would use the Schofield Study Bible and then they would take it to whatever church they were ministering in and the influence of the Schofield Study Bible would spread. And then the missionaries would take their Schofield Study Bible overseas with them when they were preaching the gospel because the study notes helped them to explain scripture. And so Schofield's influence extended around the world and not just... Um, just general Christian theology, but in particular dispensational premillennialism spread in uh, in large part at this time because of the Schofield Study Bible. One of the men it actually impacted later on, a few decades later, is Charles Ryrie. So that's why there's a lot of similarities between these study Bibles is because Schofield influenced uh, Ryrie. But some of the differences are rooted in... Um, you know, when they ministered and um, the context in which they were, they lived and, and, and served in their different ministry capacities. So let me give a little bit of compare, uh, yeah, comparison and contrast between the men. So Schofield lived from 1843 to 1921. Ryrie lived from 1925 to 2016. As far as education goes, there's a little bit of mystery regarding Schofield's education. So there is evidence that later in his life, Schofield was signed his name, C.I. Schofield, and then add two capital D's at the end, which signify a degree. Traditionally, a capital D, capital D um, signifies a doctorate of divinity, but there's not great 
records, historical records on where Schofield earned that. So it's a little bit of a mystery to it, but he did sign his name as seemingly a doctor of divinity. Um, that was not his trade. He, he had, he was trained in a, a secular, secular field, um, and worked in a secular field, uh, prior to pastoring. Charles Ryrie got a master's and a doctorate of theology from Dallas Theological Seminary. So like I said, Schofield would, he worked secular jobs, but then he pastored in congregational and reformed churches. Ryrie's ministry is best known for his teaching career at Dallas Theological Seminary. He did teach at other schools, but he's most known, I think, for his uh, ministry at Dallas Theological Seminary. Schofield uh, is also known for founding what is today called Cairn University, C-A-I-R-N, Cairn University. And Ryrie was actually the president of Cairn University from 1958 to 1962. Schofield, in his lifetime, served with the well-known pastor, Dwight Moody. Charles Ryrie, study Bible, <laughs> is, is published by Moody Press. <laughs> That's a little bit of a stretch as far as comparison, but Serve with Moody, published by Moody Press. It seems like a similarity to me. Schofield's original study Bible, sometimes it's referred to as the old study Bible. I'll get to that in a minute. It was published in 1909, and Ryrie's study Bible was published in 1976. Both are theologically conservative, and in relation to eschatology, both are dispensational premillennialists. So the differences, Schofield study Bible teaches the gap theory. The gap theory is a, um, a view of creationism that suggests that there is a gap of time between Genesis one, two and, or yes, Genesis one, two and Genesis one, three. So the gap theory is often compared and contrasted with other creationist viewpoints, um, like young earth creationism, old earth creationism, and then non-creationist viewpoints too, different evolutionary theories. But the gap theory is one explanation uh, for how the universe, how the earth came to be. Ryrie study Bible does not advocate for the gap theory. Another difference is that the original Schofield study Bible utilized James Usher's timeline of history. Uh, perhaps some of you have heard that before. It's pretty well known. Um, but not ever, but it's kind of a minority view today. James Usher lived from 19, uh, 1581 to 1656. He was an Irish Anglican bishop. And again, he's best known for teaching that God created the earth on October 23rd, 4004 BC. And so he, his argument is based on different passages of scripture. And then he attempts to backdate all of the events of Genesis. And he concludes that God created the earth on October 23rd, 4004 BC. Now, some Christians, even at the time, some Christians agreed with Usher's conclusions. Other disagreed. Uh, Schofield, this is now centuries later, of course, a few centuries later, Schofield agreed with Usher's findings. So he was one of the ones that supported that particular uh, date of creation. Now, Schofield study Bibles that came later actually removed Usher's timeline from the study notes. Um, let me just first say that Ryrie's study Bible does not include the Usher timeline. So, so why is this called number three? So Schofield's original study Bible that was published in 1909 is called, you know, the original study Bible, the Schofield that was published in 1909, or the, the Schofield study Bible one, if you want to refer to it that way. And it used the King James version of the Bible that the Schofield study Bible was revised in 1917. And then again, Schofield died in 1921. And then in 1967, an eight person committee revised the Schofield study Bible. So again, this is, you know, 40 plus years after Schofield uh, passed away. So he didn't have anything to do with that, that new edition. And this is the, that's the one I'm showing you here, the new edition. Um, and that's why it's called this, the Schofield study Bible three. So the, the original 1909, the 19, 
17 revision, and then the 1967 <clears throat> New Schofield Study Bible, or the Schofield, Stu <clears throat> Schofield Study Bible, uh, number three. Um, and this one comes in a variety of uh, different translations, including the one I'm showing here is the New King James Version. The Ryrie Study Bible, on the other hand, uh, comes in all popular translations today. This is the American Standard Version I have here. Um, but there's King James, New King James, NIV, ESV, NASB. So you can pretty much get this one in any translation. I can't re remember all the translations that are available in the in the number three. But so the if you're looking for different translations for Schofield, you would need to get the, the third version. All right. What is dispensational premillennialism? I feel like I could talk hours about uh, uh, this because it's a, you know, it can be um, a very substantial theological discussion, the differences between eschatological uh, viewpoints. Um, premillennialism is often contrasted with amillennialism and postmillennialism. The, the passage, one of the primary passages that's debated in this conversation is Genesis or Revelation 20 verses one through six. And then, and the question that's asked is what is the nature of that 1000 year period that's mentioned in Revelation uh, 20 verses one through six. And premillennialists argue that the 1000 years is uh, a literal period of time that will follow the second coming of Christ. So um, premillennial dispensationalists, um, the major order of events for that particular view in regard to the end times is the rapture, the tribulation, the second coming, the 1000 year millennium, and then the eternal state. Now th there's more to it than th just that, but that's just, that's just kind of the framework. So dispensations, a dispensation is an era of time. Uh, it's a period of time. It's a season of history and different dispensationalists organize um, history in a little bit different way. So they organize the dispensations differently. What Schofield teaches in his study Bible is that there are seven dispensations altogether. There's, there's uh, innocence, conscience, government, promise, law, grace, and kingdom or millennium. Um, so that's, that's what's reflected in the Schofield um, study Bible. All right. Now, lastly, um, the story of the $7 million collection. <laughs> so this is actually uh, Charles Ryrie. So Ryrie in his lifetime was an avid collector of books, including rare Bibles and also some biblical manuscripts, not that date back to the first century, uh, but date several hundred years afterward. I tried to look for more information on what was in his personal collection. Couldn't find a lot, but I know that there were some um, there were some biblical manuscripts in the collection. So upon his death, his family put his collection up for auction, and it sold for seven point three million dollars. So. My argument to my wife and perhaps to your love, you can use this for your loved ones too, is I just, I need more books. I can't keep adding to my book collection in my personal library because, um, you know, it could sell for millions of dollars after I pass away. That's actually not true at all. I'm, me arguing for, you know, needing more books is always true, but um, it's not going to sell for millions of dollars. Anyway, I hope this video has been helpful to you. Um, appreciate you watching. See you next time.